Our text today is the epistle reading. If all this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. The disciples of Jesus were devastated by the events of that Friday morning and they scattered like leaves before the wind. The innocent Christ was nailed to the very wooden beams of a cross at the very moment that the Passover lamb was offered in the great temple of God in Jerusalem. But later on, and looking back on those tragic events, they realized all of this was foretold in the scripture. Jesus is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Now you bear that in mind. Peter is saying here in this epistle, and you take the long, long view of things when false teachers sneak in among you, and they will, and deny the very Lord that bought them and they do. Nothing new has happened. And neither are the consequences. He cites two outstanding examples of God taking care of his own in fearful circumstances. He says... God did not spare the ancient world when he brought a flood upon its ungodly people. But he protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. This Bible story begins with one of the saddest lines in all of the scripture. It repented the Lord that he had made man and it grieved him in his heart. How bad do you got to be to make God repent and sorry that he ever made you exist? The unspeakable sins uh, of Noah's day were not given much of an insight. All we're told is that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God said unto Noah, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and pitch it within and without with pitch. And the length of it shall be 300 cubits, and the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make in the ark, and a door shalt thou set in the side of it, with lower, second, and three stories shalt thou make it. And God told him why. I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life. But with thee do I establish my covenant, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives. And with two of every living thing, male and female. That's not the strange part. They teach that part of the story at our Naval Academy in Annapolis. The strange part is, Noah did what God commanded him. He built a boat on dry ground. Even though the weathermen were forecasting clear skies and the graduation speakers were talking about better and brighter tomorrows and the financial planners were pointing you to security in the future and the clergymen were all telling their flocks that a loving God wouldn't hurt a flea. Noah 
kept right on ordering two by fours and cedar timbers and buckets of paint from Menards. All the while, the curiosity seekers are coming out every Sunday afternoon to see this monstrosity. And little boys are scribbling graffiti and lovers are carving their initials in the sides of it. And the talk show hosts are calling him the Admiral of the Animals with Ensign Smokey the Bear and Chief Bosun's mate, Donald Duck. Didn't it ever get under his skin? Being the butt of all those jokes, the hot sun beating down and the sweats running in your eyes and mosquitoes are swarming and those bears are mounting up over there at the lumber yard. Noah is called a preacher of righteousness. Though you're never given one instance of his mounting a pulpit or preaching a sermon. How can that be? Oh, Noah obeyed. You don't even hear that word anymore. He went right on building that ark. Rooms for his sons and his sons' wives, though Noah and his wife as yet had no children. And every day he stayed at every single hammer blow was a warning to the people among whom he lived. God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And he rescued Lot. That righteous man, because he was tormented in his righteous soul at the lawless deeds which he saw and heard. This story takes you back to the days of Abraham. The, he lived not far from the five cities of the plain of which Sodom and Gomorrah were but two. A region so scenic so lovely that they called it the Garden of the Lord because it reminded them of the Garden of Eden. But so unspeakably vile was the sin of this city and grossly perverted. Well, they didn't have a billboard out on the highway. The world's wickedest cities! Depravity is us. Oh, no. That isn't how it works. But the sin was so bad. The text tells us that God couldn't believe it and had to come down and see for himself. He let Abraham in on what he was about to do thereby giving Abraham a chance to intercede for the people of the cities among whom was his nephew Lot and his family in a humble yet a bold fashion. The old horse trader bargained with God. Will you destroy the cities, O oh Lord, if you can find 50 righteous souls in them? No. 45, 40, 30, 20. He finally whittled God down to the degree that he would not destroy those cities if he could find 10 righteous souls. That evening, Two messengers were sent into Sodom to bring out Lot and his family. But other eyes were watching. They saw fresh meat in their streets. The men of the city, young and old, 
surrounded Lot's house and demanded that he throw out his two guests to them so they could rape them. Well, so much for the fiction that homosexuality is passive and nonviolent. It went downhill after that. They declined Lot's offer of women to abuse. And then they moved on Lot himself to sodomize him. And the brief night of horror was soon over. And in the early morning light, the messengers took Lot and his family by the hand and hurried them out of the city. Run for the hills. Flee for your lives. Don't look back. And then fire and burning sulfur fell from the sky upon those cities. Why'd she do it? Lot's wife. Was it out of curiosity? Out of longing for what she left behind? They later found the salt and crusted remains of that unhappy woman lying on the shores of the Dead Sea. And Abram saw it from afar, the whole region, a blazing inferno, black smoke billowing into the sky. So scorching, so scarring the earth that to this day, Nothing grows there. Nothing lives there. My problem is the text three times calls Lot a righteous man. That ain't the word I would have thought of. He, in every single episode of the narrative, he appears in a bad light. He was self centered. In a range war between Lot's herdsmen and Abraham's herdsmen, Abram says, Lot, you, you take your pick, and I'll move my tent somewhere else. Well, Lot picks the choicest meadows over toward the cities. And the next time you find him, he's sitting right down in the gates of Sodom. He was a weak man. Morally confused, I would have said depraved. And they had to drag him by the hand to get him out of Sodom. Now, theologically, I'd have to tell you right here that the righteousness of Lot means that he was clothed with a righteousness that was not his own, that he was spared by a mercy he did not deserve, that he was saved by a power that cannot be defeated. The righteousness of God in Christ, the only righteousness that avails before the throne. But the text says, Lot was righteous because he was grieved in his soul at the lawless deeds which he saw and heard. Lot didn't cave in to the culture in which he was living. He still expressed shock and outrage at what was thrown in his face every day. Now that's not much but he also obeyed the command of God when he heard it. Please, people, don't say this stuff can't happen. It has happened. Jesus says it is happening. Wow. We're living in it. Haven't you noticed that you have got to tolerate and accept and embrace the unnatural as though or perfectly natural? Gay liberation. 
sexual diversity, alternative lifestyles, same-sex marriages. Sodomy isn't the only sin. And it's not the unforgivable sin. But it is a sin. And like all sins, it must be repented of. But if you lose your sense for sin, and then somebody tells you, repent, you don't get it. Because nothing's a sin to you anymore. And it happens like the proverbial frog in the cook pot on the stove. You throw the frog in the boiling water, he's going to jump out. Aha. Uh -huh. Gradually turn the heat up on him. And he never notices it. My children cannot imagine that American audiences gasped at the closing scene of Gone with the Wind, you know, where Rhett says to Scarlett, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Whoa. <laughs> or who can remember Ed Sullivan? On his show of shows announced the upcoming appearance of the beautiful and talented movie actress Ingrid Bergman. But such was the outcry over that woman's adulterous lifestyle. He had to cancel her appearance. Compare that with most any movie you see today or any afternoon or evening of television fair. And you will see how far we've drifted, how morally desensitized we have become. When Charlie Brown in the comics did wrong, he felt humble. When Bart Simpson does wrong, he feels victimized and hardly anybody notices. Elliot Chambers is a 16-year-old high school student up in St. Paul. He's in civil court today because he wore a sweatshirt to high school which said on the front, straight pride. And on the back was a picture of a male and a female holding hands. The administration took that as a vicious attack on their sexual diversity program as a hate crime against gay pride. Well, that's the world we're living in. But we're not here to affirm our culture or save our American culture or be a friend to our American culture. You and I are here to obey God. That's the first commandment you may remember. And it cannot be harder for you than it was for Noah in his day or Lot in his. Rescuing, shielding, cleansing, saving, that's God's business. And if these things are true, and I wouldn't bet against them, then God also knows how to rescue his own from their trials. Because if he could rescue Noah 
from the deluge and Lot from the city of Sodom. Do not fear, my friends. Take heart. Then he knows how to rescue you and me. Amen. The peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.